Welcome back to the channel. I'm the GCSE science teacher. In today's video, we are going to be learning a brand new topic here on my channel called chemical changes. This is part of the GCSE chemistry course. If you do find the video helpful, feel free to like it, share it with someone else, and please also do subscribe. Thank you so much if you already have subscribed. It's amazing to have you here. Um, and like I said, this will be in a brand new playlist for you, along with all the other playlists here on my channel for biology, chemistry, and physics as well. So if you are trying to get your revision together, I know lots of you have mock exams coming up or you may have done some mock exams and you're now preparing for the real thing. Um, hopefully you'll find those videos helpful and you can also find more of my resources on my Instagram and TikTok. All the links are on my channel bio so hopefully you can find that and it's easy to navigate but in case not everything is at the GCSE Science Teacher. So let's get started. Well first of all Today's topic, like I said, is going to be about the reactivity series. But what actually is the reactivity series? Well, you can see it here. It's essentially a list of metals and they're in order of reactivity. Scientists use these to kind of determine how metals will react when they are either reacting with other metals or other metal compounds or just in different solutions, maybe water or acids or even with oxygen. So the reactivity series has been compiled by scientists and is a really useful way of determining the reactivity of certain metals. And also it can be used for things like metal extraction, which is a really useful process, especially when we want to gain more um, metals that are more precious, maybe that are more useful um, and maybe more difficult to obtain without the extraction process. So more on this in a moment, but one thing that students find tricky with the reactivity series is actually remembering the order of it. So you don't get given this in the exam, unfortunately, um, but this is a way that you can remember it. And you might have wondered why there were so many animals <laughs> on this video um, and how this somehow links to the reactivity series. Well, it's a mnemonic. So we have potassium for penguins, sodium for swim, lithium for lively. So the mnemonic goes, penguins swim lively, carrying many colorful zebras. In the lake, hippos chase swimming, giraffes playfully. Um, so it's just a bit of a fun way to remember it for the exam. Lots of students find this sort of thing helpful, especially if you could make your own. This is just one as an example for you. But as you can see, you can see you have your potassium, your sodium, your lithium, your calcium, and your magnesium all at the top. These are very reactive metals, specifically uh, potassium as it's at the top. We then have carbon, which you may have realized is a non-metal, and we'll come on to why that's in there in a moment. We then have zinc, iron, tin, and lead. Lead's obviously a poisonous metal, um, but those are some other ones that are found within. Then we also have hydrogen, a gas, but not a metal, which you may have thought, oh, okay, why is that in there? We then have copper, silver, gold, and platinum, which are more precious metals. So we do need to remember the, the sequence and the order um, from the most reactive at the top, which is potassium, to the least reactive, which is gold. And sometimes we actually call this an inert metal because it really does not react with anything. Um, one thing to say, you could come up with your own um, mnemonic. This is one that could help you as well. Something else that students find helpful, um, I personally find mnemonics more challenging to remember because it's more things to remember to remember something else, but something I've personally found helpful is actually grouping these metals. Um, so if you look at the top, top few, you can see that they all end in Ium or hm, and that's why I remember them there. So potassium, sodium, lithium, calcium, magnesium, they all end in the hm sound. Um, so that helps me order those, and it's just a matter of making sure I know which one is at the top and which one comes after it. So there's a few less to remember in one go. Then you have um, the shorts, the shorter metals, so the zinc, the iron. Um, these are all very small types of metals that are short in, in name, okay? So that's why they're in the middle. And then the last ones at the bottom, are all the precious metals that have to do with either money or jewellery. Um, so you've got things like gold and platinum. Um, and these are very unreactive or inert, as I said, um, which actually kind of makes a lot of sense because you wouldn't want metals that are reactive on your skin or on your hands, would you? because obviously that would be quite dangerous. 
So that's another way to remember it. And some students I've taught have found that helpful. Um, so just as a bit of info, like I said, the most reactive metals are at the top, the least reactive are at the bottom. And we know that the ones at the top are more reactive because they react vigorously. We can actually observe this when we add potassium to some water or lithium to some water or sodium, for example, we can actually see that they will ignite on the water, um, potentially produce a flame when reacting with water. Um, I'm going to talk about the different metal reactions that you need to know for GCC in a moment, but that is one way we can actually determine this, is actually seeing how vigorously they react. Um, we also know whenever we're talking about reactivity of metals, remember that metals will always form a positive ion or a cation, and that's because they lose electrons, they donate electrons, so they become, become more stable. Um, and they donate those electrons to um, non-metals, and that's how they can form those ionic bonds or metallic bonds, for example. Um, like I said as well, non-metals are used for extraction of metals. So like I mentioned, the reactivity series is really helpful because it can tell us how different substances can be used to extract metals, such as carbon, such as hydrogen. These are two non-metals that can be used in the extraction process. And I will be making a video on extractions of metals um, specifically for GCC because there's quite a few things that you need to know, such as bio-mining, phyto-leaching, but also the extraction using carbon and things like that. Also electrolysis as well, which I know is quite a um, no, I don't want to say complicated topic, but there's quite a few things to consider. So I will be making videos on that. So let me know in the comments below if that's something you are interested in. So here is a detailed overview of the different reactions that you need to know for GCSE. I personally would recommend taking a screenshot of this if you're watching this on your phone or if you're watching this on your PC. Pause the video, take an image of it. You can even write this out yourself if you want to. When I was looking through the curriculum, these were the key examples or the key expectations that you need to know for metal reactions. So let's go through them and I'm going to explain the extra bits of detail around them as well. So the first one is when metals react with water. So if we have, for example, lithium, which is a metal and it reacts with water, will form the metal hydroxide. So it would be lithium hydroxide. But we also form a hydrogen gas as well. Now, we can actually prove that we form this. So if you ever get asked how to prove it, well, metal hydroxide, like lithium hydroxide, that's an alkali substance. So you could just add universal indicator and you'd be able to see that the colour of the water would change to like like a purpley uh, blue color and that would actually determine that would tell you that there was alkalis there or base hydrogen as well we can actually test for if we use a lit splint um, we can actually see that glowing splint that lit splint it actually if we place that in the hydrogen gas if we were to collect some in a test tube we could hear a squeaky pop sound and that way you can actually determine that hydrogen's there one thing to remember if you ever get asked how to test for hydrogen don't just say squeaky pop test you actually have to say what you do so the squeaky pop is the sound that proves there's hydrogen there but what you're doing is using a lit splint to actually ignite the flame and cause that sound to occur um, the second type of reaction that you need to know is what I like to call the mash reactions. That's not actually the name of it. It's just a way I remember it. This is um, kind of like an acronym. So mash reactions to me means metals plus acids. And this makes a salt and hydrogen. Um, so if you have, so for example, let's say lithium again, the metal of choice, clearly. So if we have lithium and an acid, let's say nitric acid, we will form the salt version of that metal and acid and hydrogen gas again. So the salt that you make, we actually need to know how to name the salt, which is why on the right hand side, you can see I have a bit of a cheat sheet for you. So anytime you get asked to name a salt, these are the key ideas you need to be aware of. Um, if you have hydrochloric acid, you're always going to make a chloride salt. If you have nitric acid, you're going to make a nitrate salt. Sulfuric acid, you're going to make a sulfate salt. Be very careful with the the suffix of these salt names. So can you see that chloric acid makes chloride, nitric makes nitrate, sulfur sulfuric makes sulfate. Those are really important to distinguish so you get the marks. So let me give you an example. Like I said, lithium is the, is the metal of choice here. So we've got lithium plus hydrochloric acid goes to make lithium chloride plus hydrogen. Let's do a different one. Let's say sodium plus nitric acid. Sodium plus nitric acid goes to make sodium nitrate plus hydrogen. 
Let's do one last one. We have, let's say, uh, potassium and sulfuric acid. So potassium plus sulfuric acid goes to make potassium sulfate and hydrogen. So you're naming the salt based on the acid and the metal will just be in front of the acid name. Um, if you want some more practice of this, I can leave some um, examples in the description box below. Just just have a have a look through there because I do like to leave interesting links and things. So I'll, I'll leave some examples for you if you if you want a bit more of an explanation on that one. Um, but those are the three acids that you're really going to come across at GCSE. There are, of course, lots of lots more than that. Um, but those are the key ones that they like to ask. Um, you also have another type of reaction called an oxidation reaction. Now, you may have heard of oxidation in the idea of oxidation and reduction um, in terms of electrons, but actually oxidation can mean something else as well. So oxidation can also mean a reaction where oxygen is present. So if we have a metal, let's say lithium again, it's the choice metal today. It just came to my mind again. Um, let's say lithium reacts with oxygen. You're going to just form the metal oxide. So it's going to be lithium plus oxygen makes lithium oxide or sodium plus oxygen makes sodium oxide it's a very simple plain easy reaction to remember but it's just worth putting in there as well um neutralization reactions this is one that you've probably seen more often than the others because especially it's taught at, at key stage three um this is a very straightforward one again neutralization just remember the word neutral you're producing neutral uh, pH substances. So your water is pH 7. It turns green in the presence of universal indicator. Salts are also neutral as well. Neutralization reactions, when you have an acid and a base, so remember acids have a pH of anything below uh, 7, so 1 to 6. Um, they turn red or orange in the presence of universal indicator. If you add that and mix it, with a base in equal amounts, um, you will get a salt and water that forms. Remember, bases are anything that have a pH above pH 7, so 8 to 14, it will turn purpley blue in a universal indicator if that's present there. And remember that they have to be in equal amounts so that they can ca actually react together and cancel out. If there's an excess of one, you will have a slight acidic solution or a slight alkali solution. So they have to be in equal amounts for a new, true neutralization reaction to occur. And again, you can test for a neutralization reaction simply by adding universal indicator and that will turn green. In fact, you could actually add universal indicator to the acid and the base and pour them in together and you can see that reaction occur um, and the color change occur before your very eyes, which is quite exciting. And then the last one is a carbonate reaction. Okay, so this is a slightly different type of reaction in the fact that a different product is formed compared to all the other ones, so a different gas, I should say. So if we have a metal and it's in the carbonate form, so let's say calcium carbonate, that's actually one that's quite common and um, that you might actually use it in classrooms. So calcium carbonate, you can react with different substances. Let's say, for example, in this case, you're going to react it with some of the acid. Let's say one of the acids we've chosen, sulfuric acid, for example. So calcium carbonate plus the sulfuric acid or any acid will always make the same three things. It will make water, it will make a salt, and it will make carbon dioxide. Um, remember, the salt will be based on the um, acid that you've used. So calcium carbonate plus sulfuric acid will make calcium sulfate. Um, the carbon dioxide that's produced, again, you can kind of test for this because it will um, extinguish a lit uh, splint. So it will, it will make the uh, the fire go out, if you will. Um, and obviously water, you will be able to see that's present. You could test for water. It has pH of seven. Um, so these are all different ways to determine what you've actually created Um as the actual thing you wanted. So um, the last thing just on this slide, something to be aware of, a lot of students ask, how do you know if it's a carbonate? How do you know if it's an alkali? How do you know if it's a base? How do you know if it's an acid? How do you know? How do you know any of this? How do you remember? Um, key idea for you, okay, if it's an acid, it will say the word acid in it. Um, if it's a carbonate, it will say the word carbonate in it. Um, or you'll see like CO3, for example, um, next to the formula. If it's an alkali or a base, it will end in either hydroxide or oxide. Um, those are the two ones that students often find a bit tricky. So hydroxide or oxide, that will tell you that it's an alkali substance, and therefore you can proceed with whichever reaction you um, can see in, in the question. So really worth making a note of these so you can see them 
um, clearly and you know what the products are because often you could get asked to determine the products or balance an equation, that sort of thing. And it's worth being aware of what actually forms when um, as well. Okay, so even though I've spoken about all the different reactions you need to know at GCSE, there is one more metal reaction which I didn't mention, but I'm mentioning it now because it's very specific to the reactivity series and it links nicely with um, reactivity of metals as well. And it's this idea of displacement reactions. Now, as the word might suggest, displacement is to swap something out for something else. And in this case, a more reactive metal will displace a less reactive metal from its compound. Essentially, it will push it out of its place and actually take over that compound. It's kind of a, if you want to see it as a bit of a, a cheeky way of getting out um, from the reactivity series and into a compound, it's, the more reactive metal will take that place of the less reactive one. Um, so for example, we have magnesium and you can see magnesium is pretty reactive. It's up at the top. It's number one, two, three, four. It's number five in the reactivity series. So it's pretty reactive, I'd say. It reacts with copper sulfate. And as you can see, copper sulfate, that must be a salt because it ends in sulfate. Um, and it produces magnesium sulfate and copper. Now, what's going on here? As you can see, the magnesium has displaced the copper in the salt compound. And that's because if you look at magnesium, and you look at where copper is in the reactivity series, magnesium is higher up in the reactivity series than copper. Therefore, it is more reactive than copper, and that's why it displaces the copper from the compound. So I'm gonna give you a go. This is sodium and calcium sulfate reacting together. I'd like you to predict what you think the products will be. Comment down below. I will leave the solution in the description box as well, but please do have a go in the comments. It'd be great to hear from you. And that's it from me. Thank you so much for your time today. I've been the GCSE science teacher and you have been curious. If you did enjoy the video, feel free to give it a like and subscribe. It would be amazing to have you here, especially as the exam season starts very, very soon. I can't believe it. Um, if you are wanting specific videos, if you have any questions, you can always ask me in the comment section as well. I'm more than happy to answer any queries you have about GCSE sciences, whether it's biology, chemistry or physics. But in the meantime, if you do want to have a bit more revision, you can see some of my videos that I've put at the end of this video here and also my social media is on this side TikTok and Instagram everything is at the GCSE science teacher so if you are interested feel free to join those communities join this community as well it's a big community really so feel free to subscribe if you haven't already and thank you so much for your support in the meantime have a great day and I'll catch you in the next one bye